Well, I was going to give you a preview of, this is, this is the official beginning of season three, whatever that means, of two brief bios, but I have to pull up Slack here, one sec, so that I can share with you some of the names of folks that we're going to cover in this season. So today is John Chrysostom. And then we're going to hit Constantine the 11th, St. Patrick, William Farrell, J. Gresham Machen, Martin Luther. You'll take him? Okay. Uh, someone from the Salem Witch Trials, undetermined yet. But then Ann Hutchinson follows, and she's from the Salem Witch Trials, so... Uh, Blaise Pascal, uh, Francis Scarina. No one knows who he is, but Mike Lichter does. So, uh, Leonard Ravenhill, Francis Schaefer, and Theodore Roosevelt. So there we go. That's our lineup for this season of two brief bios. Today it is John Chrysostom. So let's begin with prayer and we'll quickly go through his life. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your mercy to us in Jesus. Thank you that you have redeemed us, miserable sinners, and you have uh, and will glorify us. In Christ. And Father, we pray as we study uh, your servants in history that you would bless us, that you would encourage us, that you would uh, rebuke us and correct us, uh, all for the glory of your Son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. This is on, right? Does it sound like it's on? Does it sound now like it's on? May just need to crank the volume a little bit. Just bring the volume up a little bit seems a little dull. I want it to be screamingly loud. <clears throat> All right, so John, it's number 11. John Chrysostom. John is his name. Chrysostom is his, is his sort of nickname. Now that's a little too loud. Thanks. I'll have to whisper. John Chrysostom is an early church father, so we haven't, uh, we haven't done many of these in our bios. Have we gotten into the early church fathers? I can't remember. A couple of them? Well, who? I probably did them both. Yeah. Oh, brother. I have a good memory. It's just short. Um, <clears throat> he was born in 347 in a city called Antioch. What do we know Antioch for? First place, yeah, where the Christians were called Christians. And it's whose hometown? Paul. Yeah, the Apostle Paul. And he, uh, and so that's where in 347, Chrysostom, this John guy, was born. It is in modern Turkey, Antioch, right set between. Uh, right at the end of the Mediterranean Sea, set between Turkey and Syria. Right, uh, I think it's modern Turkey. It would have been in ancient Syria uh, during that time. He died in 407 in Constantinople. Right, he is he's a contemporary of these men who were very important uh, in the development of theology. Gregory of Nan- Nan- Nazianzus. Gregory of Nyssa, and Basil of Caesarea. Those, those are men you probably haven't read, but you have been impacted by their theology, especially their Trinitarian theology. They were the, the men who developed the Orthodox uh, Trinitarian theology. They fought against Arianism, so we owe them a lot in that fight against Arianism because Arianism during their time and during this time, had basically taken over the whole world. Um, And it was through this, these uh, men's work that uh, it 
the church was in a sense reclaimed from Arianism. Chrysostom lived a, a past them by a few decades, and so uh, these early church fathers, those three guys, the two Gregories and Basil, are called the Cappadocian fathers. So John Chrysostom studied with the theologian Diodore of Tarsus, and Diodore had reconstituted the school of Antioch. There were a couple schools of interpretation at the time. There was a school of Antioch, there was a school of Alexandria. Antioch was known for its sort of grammatical, historical, literal interpretation of Scripture. The school of Alexandria was sort of wild, um, allegorical interpretation of Scripture. Uh, Origen would be of that school, and Chrysostom would have been of the Antiochene school. And so, the very literal interpretation of Scripture, how we would interpretate, interpretate, interpret Scripture. Interpretate is something entirely different. I'm surprised you don't know what it means. <laughs> and so, um, <clears throat> Chrysostom, that is not his last name. It actually, in Greek, means golden-mouthed. He, got to be, he, he was so eloquent in his preaching and in his style that they called him Chrysostom, golden-mouthed. And he, he became renowned for his preaching, described as both eloquent but convicting, strong, and direct. Uh, we have a huge number of his sermons, which is incredible that it's 347 and we have uh, books and books and books of his sermons. Uh, he... Um, they were transcribed by listeners, and then he reviewed them and then published them afterwards. And so we have uh, hundreds and hundreds of sermons from him. And so we can go back and we can uh, look exactly at uh, what he said, and uh, you can piece his life together by some of the statements he makes about events that are happening or things that are happening to him, and he's expressing those in his sermons. For three years, he um, was, bishop, was assistant to the bishop in Antioch, a guy named Melidios. Around 30, um, uh, 371 or 372, an attempt was made to, which seems to be... Uh, you know, common throughout the history of the church, to forcibly ordain him. He, having already become quite an ascetic, right? Do we know what an ascetic is? Uh, the harsh treatment of the body, self-denial, um, not eating, not sleeping. He had, uh, he had spent some time with, uh, with others as an ascetic, well, when they tried to forcibly ordain him, he left the city. He got out of Dodge, left one of his friends to be forcibly ordained, and his friends was sort of like, thanks, John. Um, <clears throat> he left the city. He headed for the mountains surrounding Antioch. And so around Antioch, there are mountains. In the mountains were a number of monkish sort of ascetics that uh, had their schools and camps and communes up in the mountains. He, it was said he had two motives in going there. One was to avoid that ordination that he believed really was, was premature, he, that he was unprepared for. And then second, because he was having difficulty controlling his sexual desires, which he called vicious passions. And so he, he was going to... Um, he was going to try to quell the passions by the harsh treatment of the body. Okay, and so he went up into the hills. He would spend four years in the mountains with some kind of Syrian guru monk guy. He spent four years with him. He continued uh, throughout his whole life to speak highly of asceticism and highly of the time that he uh, had spent there. Uh, he, after that four years of semi-communal life, he went to live by himself in a cave for 
thrice eight months, is how he put it. For two years, he lived by himself in a cave. He said later that he passed most of that long span without sleeping, memorizing large portions of the Old and New Testaments, and that for the entire two years, he never lay down by night or day. Did not lie down. Um, <clears throat> he ate a meager diet, he had long fasts, and of course his health would be severely damaged by this time that he spent in a cave not sleeping and eating. And his early biographer Pal Palladios says his gastric regions were deadened and the functions of his kidneys were impaired by the intense cold. Right, no space heater in the cave up in the mountains of Antioch. Um, no fire, no nothing. He lived in that cave very meagerly without anything. He would suffer throughout his life from rushes of blood to the head, stomach trouble, insomnia, and extreme sensitivity to winter cold for the rest of his life. So what was the deal with neglecting sleep? This was a common practice of the ascetics during this time of uh, this time of the um, the uh, church. the The highest ideal they said was to be communing continually with God. Sleep disturbed that communion, and so they did anything they could to keep from sleeping, which meant never lying down. Um, I just can't, I mean, sleep deprivation is, is a technique we use when we're torturing people, right? Uh, sleep deprivation is one of the worst torments that some of you have ever experienced, insomnia or things like this. But this was a dedicated, like, I'm not going to sleep because it, it, uh, it stops my communion with God. And so... Very intense commitment to the harsh treatment of the body. And uh, he never repudiated this. He never came to a time where he said, well, you know, this has no power against the flesh. He always spoke very highly of this time and um, these practices. And he, he would later throughout his ministry, he would really take it to the monks that he thought were very worldly. Uh, and, uh, and were giving themselves just to the life of the city. And he thought there should have been a little more asceticism in these men. So why did he return to the city of Antioch? So he's up there six years, last two years are in the cave. He returns to Antioch because his health was breaking down. I mean, he, he, could, he was going to die if he stayed in that cave any longer. And Kelly, uh, J.N.D. Kelly... Um, the biography that I read in preparation, it's called Golden Mouth, um, writes, it was the Savior's providence, he claimed, which exploiting his enfeebled condition for the benefit of the church obliged him to abandon the cave. So he said he attributed it to God's providence driving him back to the serve in the church and out of the cave by, by making his body break down. He would later say many have gone from the monastic retreat to the active life of the priest or the bishop. Many of those who have gone from the monastic retreat to active life as a priest or bishop are completely unable to face the difficulties of their new situation. Right? Two different things. Harsh treatment of the body is very difficult in its own way, but then life as a bishop or priest in the church <laughs> has its own difficulties for which that never prepared them. And... Uh, I, I guess that uh, two years alone, you only have to deal with yourself, which sounds pretty awful. He became a deacon in the church, which uh, deacons assisted in baptisms, and they trained the catechumens at this time, and they also did what we would consider to be diaconal work, which is care for the poor and sick. This would, being a deacon was essentially one step below being a priest. Uh, then he became a priest in 386. He's 37 year, years old at this time. 37 years old, 
He becomes a priest. Um, Though the bishop of these towns, the bishop of Antioch, the bishop of Constantinople, would normally have done the preaching work in the church, the, the bishop of Antioch, Flavian, knew that he had a talented man in Chrysostom and so gave him every opportunity he could to preach in the churches in the city. Uh, and so very quickly, after he was ordained a priest, he became known for his, his preaching. He preached extempore. People, said, people, it is said, were amazed that he had no scrap of paper or book in his hand, but held forth impromptu, something they had never seen before. So completely without anything. Um, and being eloquent in that. I think all of us could get in front of people and speak. <laughs> but the problem would be getting in front of people and speaking on Scripture eloquently. Um, that would be very difficult with, without, that, um, <clears throat> without those helps. On Sunday, 21st of February, 387... John harangued the congregation in the old church in Antioch on Paul's advice to Timothy. Right? Paul's advice to Timothy was drink a little wine for your stomach's sake. 1 Timothy 5.22. Now listen how he harangued them. He, he took the occasion to criticize our simpler brothers who when they see people getting drunk and behaving disgracefully call for a ban on wine. Right? Even though he's an ascetic, right? even though he's you know, cut off everything, he, he, he lays into the simpler brothers who, when they see drunkenness, are like, let's get rid of the source. Right? Um, when you see violence, let's ban guns. That sort of idea. Wine, he pointed out, is God's creation. It is not the mere use of it that causes drunkenness, but immoderate indulgence in it. In his... In his um, words to these Christians, um, he, he went on to say, um, I think he moved from, from drunkenness on to blasphemy. He said, if they should come across someone blaspheming God, they should rebuke him sharply, if necessary, striking him in the face. And then he said this, make your fist holy by that blow. <laughs> Oh, man. Yeah, it's great. It's really good stuff. Um, if you come across someone blaspheming God, rebuke him sharply, if necessary, striking him in the face. Make, that, make your fist holy by that blow. Stop that blasphemy. So he get a taste for his straightforwardness in his sermons and in his preaching. Um, Today, pastors soften everything, soften even what Scripture is very explicit in. Soften every blow, right? Pull all their punches. Never get passionate about any topic, right? And so very cool, very collected, very calm, and very cold is, I think, our pulpits. I'm not... I'm. I have no problem with him saying what he has said here, especially on drunkenness and on alcohol. Um, as far as striking somebody, be careful. <laughs> you reap what you sow. But the blasphemy of God, which we take in all the time and hear all the time, we just don't do anything about. We never defend God. We never defend his name. We hear people in our, in our, and I'll get to this in a second, we hear this in our movies, we hear this in the, 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 stupid, uh, the stupid tunnels we go down on social media, on all the memes and all this. We hear blasphemies of God and it just doesn't even affect us at all, which shows you that our zeal for God's name has grown very cold. Right, so, so hear what he's saying here and uh, take what is righteous and spit out the bones. 386, 387, until 397, he's a priest in Antioch. He's preaching the word. One of his favorite themes, 
And this, again, ties into what, just what I said. Um, one of his favorite themes was the corrupting influence of the theatrical shows in the city. He constantly came back to the corruption of entertainment. Pounded and pounded and pounded on this. And I, I want to share with you a, a section of one of his sermons because it is incredibly helpful to us, again, who live in Vanity Fair. We have plopped down right in the middle of Vanity Fair. And we indulge in all the same things that the, the worldly around us indulge in. Right? We, we have not distinguished ourselves from the world. Uh, this is to our shame. And, and listen to this, just the snippet of this sermon that he preached. Why do I talk about the theater? He asks. Often if we meet a woman in the marketplace, we are alarmed. But you sit in your upper seat, right, in the theater. You sit in your, your skybox. Where there is such an invitation to outrageous behavior and see a woman, a prostitute, entering bareheaded and with a complete lack of shame, dressed in golden garments, flirting coquettishly and singing harlot songs with seductive tunes and uttering disgraceful words. She behaves so shamelessly that if you watch her and give consideration, you will bow your head in shame. Do you dare to say you suffer no human reaction? Is your body made of stone or iron? I shall not refrain from saying the same things again. Surely you are not a better philosopher than those great and noble men who were cast down merely by such a sight. Have you not heard what Solomon says? If someone walks onto a fire of coals, will he not burn his feet? If someone lights a fire in his lap, will he not burn his clothing? Is it just the same for the man who goes to a woman that doesn't belong to him? For even if you do not have intimate relations with the prostitute, in your lust you coupled with her, and you committed the sin in your mind. And it was, and it was not only at that time, listen to this, but also when the theater has closed and the woman has gone away, her image remains in your soul along with her words, her figure, her looks, her movement, her rhythm, and her distinctive and meretricious tunes. And having suffered countless wounds, you go home. Is it not this that leads to the disruption of households? Is it not this that leads to the destruction of temperance and the breakup of marriages? Is it not this that leads to wars and battles and odious behavior lacking any reason? For when saturated with that woman, you return home as her captive, your wife appears more disagreeable, your children more burdensome, and your servants troublesome, and your house superfluous. Your customary concerns seem to annoy you, when they relate to managing your necessary business and everyone who visits is an irritating nuisance. The cause of this is that you do not return home alone, but keep that prostitute with you. She does not go visibly and openly, which would have been easier, for your wife could have quickly driven her away. But she is ensconced in your mind and your consciousness and she lights within you the Babylonian furnace, or something much worse. Therefore, I make this proclamation. Listen to this. I make this proclamation in a loud and clear voice, that if anyone after this exhortation and teaching deserts back to the unlawful disgrace of the theater, I shall not receive him within these precincts. I will not let him share in the sacraments, I will not let him touch the sacred table. Just as shepherds separate the sheep that are afflicted by mange from the healthy sheep, so as to prevent the rest from catching the disease, so I shall act in the same way. For if in ancient times the leper was ordered to sit outside the camp, and even if he was a king was expelled along with his crown, so much more should we expel from this sacred camp the one who has leprosy in his soul. Just as in the beginning I used exhortation and advice, so now after all this exhortation and teaching, it is necessary from now on to deploy exclusion. For it is a year since I entered your city, 
And I have not ceased from frequent and constant reminders to you about this, but since some have persisted in the putrefaction, well then, from now on, we should introduce exclusion. If I do not possess an iron sword, at least I have a word which is sharper than iron. If I cannot touch fire, I have a doctrine which is hotter than fire and can burn more fiercely. Do not, dis- do not scorn my decree. Although we are worthless and most pitiable, nevertheless, we have been granted a status by the grace of God that can achieve these things. Let such people be ejected, so that those of us who are healthy may become more healthy, and those who are sick may restore themselves from serious illness. If you shudder when you hear this decree, and I see that you are all looking gloomy and flinching. (laughs) Oh, man. Let them repent, and the decree will be canceled. For just as I have received the power to bind, so I have the power to release and to recall them back. I do not wish to excommunicate our brothers, but to dispel the disgrace of the church. For as things stand, even the pagans will laugh at us, and the Jews will mock us when we overlook our own members sinning in this way. But in the other case, they will greatly praise us and admire the church and respect our laws." I mean, that's good preaching, right? That's good preaching that no church today will allow, will not. The members of the church will not allow their pastors to preach in such a way, right? Because because the sheep are stubborn and don't want to be disciplined. The sheep want to go to Facebook and go down the wormhole and to YouTube and go down the wormhole and go to the theater and watch blasphemies and sex, right? And keep those things in our heads. And those are off limits, right, to the, to the church. And, and that's, that's sort of the, the evangelical, reformed, Presbyterian culture that we live in. And so preaching like this gets pastors fired, it gets them fired. I decree from now on, you go, you go look at pornography, you're going to be excommunicated from the church. Because we can't stand your leaven. And we don't want the church to be impure. And we don't want the church to be mocked by pagans who know that, that we're impure. Right, and then, you know, what, what the sheep then say is, well, where's the grace, man? Where's the grace in that? Where's the grace? Where's the grace of God? As if the, the discipline of the church is somehow opposed to the grace of God. As if the discipline of the church is somehow opposed to the glorious beauty of the bride of Christ, which is supposed to be pure and un, unstained and unspotted. Right? Anyway, that example, um, that whole sermon is rather incredible in his, uh, in his speaking with authority, in his laying out there these, and in, in using his authority, using his capital uh, in the church, and not being afraid to. Now, this has consequences in his life. At the end of his life, everybody is against John Chrysostom. Everybody is against him. So the times don't change, right? There's nothing new under the sun. You preach boldly and, and God will make sure you get crucified. Just like his son. One day in 398, John Chrysostom received an urgent summons from the governor of Antioch. Chrysostom was told to get himself to the gate of the city and he was picked up and driven 25 kilometers up the road to uh, Pagre, where he was given the news. He was being taken on imperial orders to Constantinople, the capital city, to be the new bishop. So his reputation had got out there. He was in Antioch for 12 years preaching, and now they take him out of the city to deliver the news. And the reason they take him out of the city to deliver the news is they don't want to riot by the people who love him and love his preaching. 
He packed the churches at this time. They were packed. If they had a guest preacher, he would get depressed because no one would show up. And he would rebuke the congregation. <laughs> right? But So they took him out. The emperor's letter had insisted that the operation should be carried out as discreetly as possible. It was feared that the populace might be tempted to demonstrate if they learned that their adored preacher was being taken from him. John is about 50 years old now when he's being consecrated the bishop of, of um, Constantinople. The most important city, the city where uh, the, the emperor and the uh, emperor's wife live, and the emperor's wife will, will come and play. This was the permanent seat of the eastern emperor and his government. And so the emperor, Arcadios, was stupid and ugly. The empress, Aelia Eudoxia, was beautiful and sharp as a whip. <laughs> um, and so you had a situation here where the empress was going to be running the show. Arcadius just was not a smart man. Eventually, the, the man who runs the empire during this time is one of the emperor's uh, eunuchs who just starts amassing wealth or amassing uh, power and calling the shots. But Arcadius and Aelia Eudoxia were members of his flock in Constantinople and attended services, attended services frequently. Now, he desired to reform the church, which again, Reformation never gets you friends, right? Um, he desired to reform the church. First order of business was to reform the clergy, right? So he's got a clean house, clean his own house first. He fought against what are called spiritual marriages. Think revoice. Spiritual friendship, we call them today. Spiritual marriages. What do you think spiritual marriages were? Remember monks, priests? What do you think spiritual marriage is? Any ideas? What? Okay. Well, spiritual marriages were, you essentially had the situation where um, priests who claimed to be celibate had in their homes what they called spiritual sisters. And, and this led to a lot of scandals, right? They, were, they had said they were committed to celibacy, but they had sort of live in, you know, it, Maybe a sister, maybe a housekeeper, maybe something like this. And eventually, you know, they would, um, uh, they would, yeah, have some baptisms to perform. Um, and it was, it was constantly an occasion for scandal. Uh, you had a very, and so, so he, he, he railed against this. It'd be interesting to to take those sermons and, and uh, apply them to Revoice, because the Revoice movement, which is the gay celibate Christian movement, claims celibacy, but they put forward this idea of spiritual friendship where, where two men who are same-sex tempted live in the same household in a covenanted friendship, right, and think that that will not lead I mean, it's not going to lead to baptisms, but it is going to lead to sodomy. And so, it would be interesting to see how those apply and see the relationship there. So, but the clergy was rich, too, and the church was poor. That was a problem, right? The clergy was, was making it, the church was poor, and the flock was simply unattended. And these were all things that Chrysostom attempted, just like, I mean, the Reformers. Just like the reformers, Luther, Calvin, those guys, I mean, um, the church was rich, and the clergy was, was a mess, right? And the flock was unattended, and uh, so he's going about the same sort of reformational principles that come in play in the 16th century. 
He would rail against the rich in Constantinople. Constantly railed against the rich. It was another one of the themes of his sermons. He was always pounding on the rich people. Um, <clears throat> the gold bit on your horse, the gold circlet on the wrist of your slave, the gilding on your shoes mean that you are robbing the orphans and starving the widow. When you have passed away, each passerby who looks upon your great mansion will say, how many tears did it take to build that mansion? How many orphans were stripped? How many widows wronged? How many laborers deprived of their honest wages? Even death itself will not deliver you from your accusers, he would say. Whew. Well, that made him more, you know, that didn't make him any friends either. He made a lot of enemies in the city of Constantinople, capital city, rich city, emperor, empress, members of his flock, especially with the empress. Uh, Chrysostom, when, when, when Chrysostom railed on riches, she took it personally. Of course, she was the richest one there. Right? So she thought that he was singling her out and railing against her. And, uh, and indeed, he was including her, but not just singling her out. And um, there came a time later, maybe 405, so he dies in 407, but early 400s, where he preaches a sermon against the sins of women. Right? Women are moral agents, women sin, but that is the most costly sermon that, is, that you can preach today or any day, right? And so he preached against the sins of women, and she knew he was singling her out. And she then did everything she could to get rid of him, okay? And, um, <clears throat> well, well, Chrysostom was away in Ephesus at some meetings. Um, she put in a, a plot in place. When he returned, he was brought before 42 bishops to answer a number of trumped-up charges. This was called the Synod of Oak, and it took place in 403. The Synod of Oak uh, in 403, and he... Um, most of the bishops that arrived there were from Egypt and really had no idea what was going on here. They were just imported for a purpose. And Chrysostom refused to see the synod as legal. He just said, no, you don't have jurisdiction. And all of the bishops had arrived. Uh, when all those bishops arrived from various places, they were uh, lavished with presents from the empress. And after his third summons, which he disregarded, he was deposed. There was an earthquake that night, and many saw it as a sign of God's displeasure with their action. He surrendered then so that the city would not explode in violence. Uh, he, 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 he did not want the city to be torn apart. And look, riots and burning down of half the city, and burning down of the churches. This sort of thing happened frequently in these ancient cities. And he did not want that to happen in Constantinople. A few days later, after, uh, after the empress had suffered a miscarriage, she pled with him to return, and he did. But those opposed to him didn't rest, <laughs> nor did she. Months later, they had other reasons to depose him, and he again, not wanting to, the city to implode, prepared for exile, and um, the Saint Sophia, the church, was burned to the ground. Uh, Chrysostom then went into exile in uh, Cacusus and took to writing there, appealing to many authorities for his vindication and protection. He would write to Innocent the I, the Bishop of Rome, he would write to all the powers and say that this, I was mishandled here, this is unjust, and um, looking for protection. But the, the relationship between the East and the West just didn't allow for much to be done for him at this point. 
Chrysostom was ordered into further exile to a cold and unknown hamlet on the shores of the Black Sea. On his way there, pushed by the soldiers beyond what he could bear, he became seriously ill. And when he knew death was near, he had them stop by the roadside where there was a small chapel, a small church. He took communion and he bid farewell and preached his final brief sermon. And his final brief sermon was, in all things, glory to God. Amen. That's what he said, his final words. And so, um, here's, a, here's a sort of summary or a, a contemplation of the work of Chrysostom uh, in, in one of the history books that I was referring to. It says this, as we compare the lives of Chrysostom and Ambrose, Ambrose over in Italy, Ambrose the one who taught Augustine, right, doing his own reforming work. As we compare the lives of Chrysostom and Ambrose, we see an indication of what would be the future course of the churches in the East as compared to the West. Ambrose faced the most powerful emperor of his time and won. Chrysostom, on the other hand, was deposed and banished by the weak Arcadius. From then on, the Latin-speaking church of the West would become increasingly powerful as it filled the vacuum left by the crumbling empire. In the Greek-speaking East, on the other hand, the empire would last another thousand years, sometimes weak, sometimes strong. This eastern offshoot of the old Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire, would zealously guard its prerogatives over the church. Theodosius was not the last Western emperor to be humbled by a Latin-speaking bishop, and John Chrysostom was not the last Greek-speaking bishop banished by an eastern emperor. And so you just see the difference. What happened in the West, in Rome, was the church got increasingly powerful and ruled over the rulers of the nations. The opposite happened in the East, and it started with Chrysostom being banished by the church. The emperors flexed their muscles, and they just liked what happened there. And so the emperors absolutely dominated the church and controlled the church in the East. And so that's... That's a way too fast overview of John Chrysostom. But it gives you some of the highlights, and if you want to go study him, that, that Golden Mouth book by Kelly is, is okay. Um, there may be better sources, but it was the one I had on my bookshelf and uh, have had referred to it before in studying Chrysostom. But what I take from Chrysostom is just once again... Go to the source documents. Always go to the source. Read Luther's sermons and Calvin's sermons and read Chrysostom's sermons to find out what their ministry is about because you can't trust anybody in the 20th or 21st century writing about their sermons to give you the straight dope. Right? You have to go read the sources and see, what they were, um, see how they preached and how they ministered. And what I, you know, I just... There's a lot we could critique about Chrysostom. There's a lot we could say about asceticism, and it's, it's foolishness, right? It's lack of power. Um, but there's a lot to be... But, but, but learn self-discipline. And, and self-discipline requires a lot of saying no to yourself and a certain sort of asceticism right? It does mean saying no. Try to lose five pounds and you realize how weak you are in just saying no, you know? But, and so I don't, I, I don't want to throw, as a way of salvation, asceticism is a miserable and failure and completely powerless. It will not save. As, as a way of just like when we fast, we learn about ourselves and where we need to repent and where our minds go. And we, we learn how to self-examine when we fast. We, we suffer, we, we deprive ourselves, and it reveals something about us. That's the good of a, of a certain sort of asceticism. It reveals what you're made up of. On the other hand, the, the boldness in preaching, right, um, there, 
you want to have a pastor who's willing who's willing to sabotage his ministry by preaching to you the word of God as it is. Right? Not pulling punches, not protecting himself, not protecting you from the word of God, but giving you the word of God and stirring you up to faithfulness. Now, whether or not you should strike blasphemers, I'll leave that to your own conscience. I don't see any direct command of Scripture where we, we are to do that, although Phineas is a pretty good example. Um, but again, that Phineas, you have to... Phineas was a Hebrew, and that was the temple and the tabernacle. You know, you have, to, you have to figure out how to apply that. But boldness in preaching that stirs you up, and, and uh, that, that is something that you should be committed to, right? You should be committed to being offended by your preacher and then saying, no, maybe it's me. Maybe he's right. Oh, maybe the Word of God... Yeah, maybe that is the Word of God. Maybe the Word of God said that to me, and and this is God speaking to me, and and you just used the dope with the bad haircut and terrible beard to speak to me, right? And how humiliating is that? I know that's humiliating for all of us, but that's how God speaks. That's how He speaks, through His Word, through a dope called by ordination to, to preach in the pulpit. And so... Uh, Chrysostom was an encouragement to me in that, an encouragement that he, he went into these big cities. He went into New York City, and he was like, I'm going to clean house. And he did, and he died because of it. Praise God, you know? Praise God. Another reformer in the church, cast out of his city uh, for doing the work of reformation. We don't have any time for questions, so let's pray. <laughs> Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for worship. Thank you for this time that you've given to us this morning. Lord, we pray that you would be with us as we worship you, that your spirit would be active in our minds and our hearts. Lord, that your word would go forth and it would produce the fruit that you have ordained for it. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that we are able to come to the table today and to feast on his body and his blood by faith. Lord, help us to do so with humble hearts and with joy in you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.